Commodore 64, a necessity for gracious living. The early 1980s was a very different period for both the video game and home computer markets. You have to remember that we were only a few decades removed from families gathering around and watching the radio together. Any of my regular viewers who are unfortunate enough to be of an age where they can actually remember such a time will attest to the fact that being able to play any half decent video games with contemporary technology at home or having the luxury of a real life computer with any kind of useful functionality in your living room was seen as either extremely niche or unrealistically expensive. I mean, this was some Star Trek level shit. This was an era when proper games were for nerds, proper computers were for affluent businessmen, and there was little deviation from that prevailing logic. It seemed for quite some time that that is just how the market was, and that's how it would remain as future gaming juggernauts such as Sega and Nintendo were yet to arrive on the international scene. Before the big console wars involving Japanese companies began in the West, our old friends at Commodore came out with a bit of kit that would quite literally revolutionise the home computer market on both sides of the Atlantic and make serious strides in bringing video games into the mainstream. That's right folks, today we're going to be looking at not just one of the most important devices that people have ever played video games on, but one of the most important machines in all of computing history, period. This little wonder sold like hotcakes. So can you keep up with the Commodore? Because the Commodore is certainly keeping up with you. I am Lady Decade and this is the story of the Commodore 64, the single greatest selling computer of all time. While the C64 is one of the machines that the Commodore brand would be most well remembered for, the roots of the C64 can be traced way back further than that. As covered on this channel before, the company would naturally progress from selling typewriters to calculators and to eventually home computers. In 1977, Commodore would make their first attempt at a microcomputer and their first foray into the home computer market. Known as the Commodore PET, the single all-in-one unit featured a built-in angled monitor which wouldn't have looked at all out of place on board the Nostromo from Ridley Scott's 1979 cinematic classic, Alien. This was a powerful and high-end piece of hardware predominantly marketed for use in schools and businesses. During the mid-1970s, Commodore had become keen to get out of the calculator market and into the home computer market due to issues with Texas Instruments, who supplied their chips, which would eventually lead to the whole calculator market freezing. Initially looking to source an already existing design, Jack Trammell and his merry band of Commodore misfits would eventually decide upon an in-house creation, powered by MOS technology, which would go on to be incorporated into many other successful home computers and consoles. Despite their best efforts to have the hardware available to retail by the end of 1976, various delays in both development and availability of materials meant Commodore weren't actually able to start selling the pet until December of 1977. Although there was a small dedicated market for home or personal use of the system, the chunky little thing retailed at almost 800 US dollars, which when adjusted for inflation is over three and a half grand. This rather extortionate price precluded it from being anything more than a system used exclusively by businesses and the very rich, which made the term home computer seem like a bit of a misnomer at this stage. Plus, the games or what games were available at least are all this weird icky shade of green and most of them are not very interesting. It was as if all Commodore was interested in was creating products for the classes, not the masses. Putting no thought into the masses where the money really was. 
Moving on to 1980, Commodore's pet successor and the system that was the true inspiration for the C64 was known internationally as the VIC-20. Basically, the intervening three years since Pitt's release had seen improvements in the levels of technology available, but also a massive decrease in costs of parts and development. Which meant that Commodore's new VIC-20 would represent a massive step up in both functionality and affordability, meaning that finally computers were to be made for the masses and not the classes. This was an exciting time in the home computer market and it seems that things were quickly changing and moving in a direction many predicted would never become a reality. With the VIC-20 cheaper and much more powerful than the PET, this was obviously great news for gamers, as it massively opened the system up to be able to show off various types of moving graphics and video game sound effects. The system eventually launched for just under 300 US dollars, which is around 890 bucks in 2022 future money. As great, as progressive and as fondly remembered as the VIC-20 was, video game technology was moving along at a blistering rate. Which meant that the poor old VIC-20 was starting to look woefully underpowered by 1982, particularly when it came to playing games. The games on offer may have been a huge step up from the pet, but they were still choppier than a Best of Ric Flair DVD and had fewer colours than the average goth's wardrobe. The VIC-20 was initially a huge seller and a massive success, becoming the first personal computer to ever sell over 1 million units. In fact, in total, it actually managed to sell a whopping 2.5 million units. But on to the C64 itself, also known as the CBM64 or Commodore Business Machine 64. The chunky bread bin looking thing was released in August of 1982 for $595 redos, or just over one and a half grand in today's money. Originally codenamed the VIC-40 as a directly named sequel to their previous system, Commodore, led by Jack Trammell, wanted to include 64 kilobytes of RAM in their new hardware to ensure that it could remain contemporary for as long as possible, which was the inspiration behind the name change. Although the entirely necessary 64 kilobyte DRAM chips were extremely expensive at this point in time, at around $100 a pop, Old Clever Clogs himself, Jack Trammell, was fully aware of the fact that they were constantly dropping in price, and was confident that the chips would be as affordable and readily available as they needed by the time their new computers went into production. This ended up being a shrewd move, as the high-end specs meant consumers didn't have too much issue with the almost $600 price tag on release, even though the C64 only had a production cost of around $130. We cannot really talk about the Commodore 64 for long without discussing one of its most beloved and fondly remembered components, the SID chip, which provided those incredibly distinctive sounds that will be immediately familiar to anyone who has spent any time with the machine. The SID chip was also used in several of Commodore's other later systems and was one of the first true dedicated sound chips of its kind to be included in a home system before the digital sound revolution of the mid 80s. But let's be honest, Commodore Music is absolutely iconic. It truly really is one of the most recognisable sound chips from any gaming device and is one of the primary reasons Commodore 64 is still so adored to this day with such a strong and active fan community keeping the old thing alive. I mean, if you think Nintendo fanboys are crazy, they have not got a shit on some of these people who are passionate about these old microcomputers. As for the sound chip, technically known as the MOS Technology 6581 or 8580, the SID got its name from the acronym Sound Interface Device and was the brainchild of Bob Yans, who later went on to co-found Ensonic Corporation. 
Jens led a team of four that included himself, two technicians and a computer-aided design operator to create and construct the SID over five months in the second half of 1981. What they had created was something truly remarkable for the time, and Jan's expertise in the field had really shone through. He was taking inspiration more from the music industry and synthesizer companies than from peers in computing, as he felt the current state of computer sound chips was massively underwhelming due to a lack of understanding of quality sound engineering within the industry. This literally explains why the music is so iconic. To quote the man himself, I thought the sound chips on the market, including those in the Atari computers, were primitive and obviously have been designed by people who knew nothing about music. His efforts were clearly successful as to this day, people are still using SID chips and the SID chip sound to make music. Great lengths have been made to preserve and restore old SIDs so original hardware can still be used. There are countless popular emulation methods, and there are even some pretty decent clone SID chips on the market, so it really can't be overstated just how much influence Bob Jans and his small team's creation had and continue to have on video games and sound engineering in general. Paired with the SID chip and being mainly responsible for handling the visual side of things was the VIC-2 or to give it its full name, the MOS Technology Video Interface Chip 2. This was the successor to the original MOS chip found in the guts of the VIC-20 and was designed very much with modern sensibilities in mind as it looked to emulate many of the graphics techniques seen in other popular systems of the time. The Texas Instruments TI-99 slash 4A, the Mattel Intellivision and the Atari 800 were all cited as influences on the design of the VIC-2 and what the chip would be capable of. Despite being such an early example of this type of processor, some nifty and rather genius design elements mean the VIC-2 can pull off some surprisingly impressive graphical feats. It seems new discoveries were being made about the chip's graphical capabilities all the time back in the day, and that is evidenced even further by some of the more recent games released for the C64 by indie developers and the homebrew community that stretch the system in almost inconceivable ways. You literally only need to have a quick look at the recent port of the original Sonic the Hedgehog to be able to see how cleverly engineered the VIC-2 must have been. Although the home computer and gaming markets were always a part of their plans going forward, the C64 initially primarily aimed at businesses and this was reflected by the relatively high price point. The low production costs meant that Commodore had a lot of leeway in this department. However, the prices would soon see massive drops as the system became more of a mainstream device. It made its way over here to good old Blighty at the start of 1983, but struggled to find an immediate install base due to the ZX Spectrum already having a large share of the market and retailing for only 175 quid. That's pound sterling in Brit speak. It wasn't long before Commodore dropped the price of their new system to 229 quid to compete with the Speccy. The two home computers continued to fight it out for brand supremacy in the UK throughout the 1980s, even into the early 90s, with both systems enjoying a similar amount of success, with the C64 only losing out ever so slightly to Sinclair's interactive phenomenon. If you think playground debates were bitchy between Nintendo and Sega fans in the 90s, the rivalry between Spectrum and Commodore fans in the UK is an all different level of bitterness. While this was going on, Commodore's big fat bread bin continued to endure success stateside, with the system dominating the low-end computer markets from 1983 to 1986. This period saw the C64 sell around 2 million units per year. This led to Commodore gaining control of close to 40% of the market at this point, with the C64 massively outselling all IBM PCs, all Apple computers, and the entire family of Atari 8-bit home computers. To say the Commodore 64 was a small success would be the understatement of the 20th century. 
At least some of this success can be attributed to the incredibly wise and forward-thinking decision by Commodore to sell the machine at popular retail outlets and department stores, as opposed to the electronics and computing stores where devices like this had previously been exclusively confined to. The company really did have bigger aspirations than just catering to nerds and businessmen. It meant it was much easier for consumers to envisage the C64 as a genuine home computer that the whole family could make use of and enjoy, or a potential alternative for kids to play games on, especially when it was being sold alongside other more traditional home products and children's toys. It's marketing genius really, and it's that marketing genius that was a catalyst for the Commodore 64 to become the highest selling home computer of all time, with an estimated 17 million units being shifted over the system's lifetime. Impressive stuff indeed. The Commodore 64 was a highly functional home computer with many uses. As previously mentioned, it was initially intended to be mainly used as a business machine, with tons of expansions, programming features and various office uses. However, it will always be remembered first and foremost as a piece of gaming hardware, and there are almost untold amounts of games available for the clever little piece of machinery. In fact, approximately over 20,000 different games were made to run on the hardware. An insane amount when you consider that the NES released that decade in North America would only see around 800 games published for it in its entire life cycle. So no wonder this computer is so synonymous with gaming. The reason for this was in part due to the C64 being so incredibly easy to program for, with developers being able to make use of the VIC-2 chip in so many different ways. Platforms like the C64 would also prove popular in an era, which was a hotbed for bedroom coders, with many hobbyists creating a variety of weird and wonderful games from their homes. Considering that a thriving homebrew community still exists for the hardware to this very day, we have not even seen the last of these releases as of yet. As for the system's original run on the market, the systems were sold all the way up until 1994, leading to an incredible 12 year run for this simple computer. Commodore's Little Brown Bread Bin was the system that absolutely refused to die, despite its parent company's best efforts, and the games were the biggest contributing factor in that longevity. Commodore would try multiple times to discontinue the C64 during the 80s, attempting to lure consumers away with 128 kilobytes with even more powerful and attractive systems. But much like with Atari and their classic wood grain VCS, the install base was just too big and consumers were just too attached to the gaming device they were used to, so most of the successes ended up failing. Through its life cycle, the Commodore 64 has had many remodels and redesigns over the years, frequently reinventing itself very much like Madonna, but with a slightly more primitive graphics. It was a cultural icon during the 80s, and was ubiquitous with gamers throughout this period. It was still selling over a million units per year, even after the Amiga range has been released, and it was only really forced to discontinue due to financial turmoil at Commodore, which led to the system ever leaving the market. There's no doubt that the C64 is one of the most legendary and influential pieces of gaming hardware ever, and it's really about bloody time that it starts getting the same levels of recognition as early Sega and Nintendo hardware on YouTube. It is, after all, the single greatest selling computer unit of all time. Not exactly a minor feat, and one that, in my opinion, deserves celebrating. So I am Lady Decade and that was the story of the Commodore 64. Well if you enjoyed my video then like, subscribe and hit that notification bell and leave me a comment down below. Let me know if you enjoyed this video and I shall perhaps consider doing some more of the like. But I would like to just say that this video would not 
be possible were it not for the generous patronage of the following people. So thank you very much to William J. Scott III, Carl Thomas, Sebastian Velez, House of the Ted, Boyd Chan, Big Papa Pickles, J. O'Malley Drone, T. Bo Baggins, Sir Landry Does Gaming, Christopher Divieo, Richard Turnbull, Green Cooper, Frank 1982, Eric Hendricks, UK Kraut Gaming, Anthony Ryan Bennett, Brent O'Hara, Stephen Quinn, Autumn Breeze, Timothy Hansmer, Ryan Dacker, Dizzy Koala, Sandbox Larry, Awesome Jacket Dude, Triforce of Shadows, Johnny Holly, OPC, Emu Movies.com, PWND Games, Consoles, Accessories, Corey Uderkirk, Ben Harradine, Gasper Heller, Sedgmeister, and Ago. As well as all of the rest of my lovely patrons. Thank you all so much.